Welcome everyone. Today we're going to be looking at the antediluvian world. In the previous stream, we looked into, according to the book of Genesis, we looked into what happened in the pre fallen world and we made a doctoral commentary. We're going to be continuing it here, right? Some people have their own different styles of Bible commentary. I personally prefer following the church fathers, but also uh, looking at messianic prophecies and typologies. And uh, what kind of what we're looking for typologies is that I think. Uh, typologies are very important, a very legitimate way of looking at scripture and lo looking at doctrine itself because they point towards to something that happens in the future, right? So they're just kind of like another form of a prophecy, except the prophecy happens in the story. Now, does that mean that the story isn't real and it's just symbolism and allegory? Absolutely not. Even the spiritual exegetes, even the spiritual exegetes, recognized Genesis as history. So that's the kind of view, and I'm talking about the church fathers here, that's the kind of view that we want to go for. Not for this academic, lame, verbose, but unnecessary, look, we're going to be looking at it from a doctrinal standpoint, and we're going to be continuing where we left off, which is Genesis 4, with the bit Cain and Abel. Now, uh, Cain and Abel, I mean, I kind of, as you know, if you don't know the story, you know, we also accommodate to your needs too. Um, but after the fall, Cain and Abel are born, and uh, Abel was a keeper of ship, Cain was a tiller of the ground, and they bring out sacrifices to God. Now, does God need sacrifice? According to Psalm 50, or Psalm 51 in the Masoretic, God does not need sacrifice. What is a true sacrifice? A sacrifice is a contrite spirit, a broken heart God will not despise. And God, does, God is not pleased with burnt offerings. Burnt offerings is not what pleases God, but rather the heart, the intent behind it. So what's the point of a sacrifice if God knows our hearts? Well, sacrifices are an outward manifestation of our inward thoughts. And that's why kind of these outward things, although they shouldn't be the sole way of doing things, right? Because that is that attitude is condemned in the New Testament. Um, it is it is something that helps us manifest our faith towards God. And so this is exactly what is happening with Cain and Abel, or what is theoretically supposed to happen. Abel's sacrifice is high quality because Abel very carefully dissected the sacrifice and brought out the fat, which is the most is the highest part of an animal. This is Saint Cyril of Alexandria in the Glyphira. He makes this kind of a commentary on on the sacrifice. Whereas Cain's sacrifice was kind of just lame. It was just you know uh, just picked up some fruits and gave to God. Right? It wasn't done carefully. He could have made a lot more effort into it. He could have put a lot more effort into it. He didn't. And so the 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 strong sacrifice of Abel and the weak sacrifice of Cain, they signify the inward thoughts, right? So the Orthodox Study Bible also makes a commentary that um, Abel uh, had the good intentions. Cain did not have the right intentions. and But the right intentions were manifested in their outward sacrifice. And so God accepted the sacrifice of Abel, right? But Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. And Cain, because of that, was very angry. He was sad. Uh, he was jealous. He felt he felt uh, hor you know he felt horrible. And God, we can see here that you know. And this is th this whole story kind of also shows uh, God's mercy and His condescension to creation because Cain has no right to be really angry about this. His sacrifice was bad it was a bad sacrifice he should have done much better and now he's just he's just mad about it he's being a baby about it and god says why are you you know why are you why are you sad and of course god knows that he's sad before he even asks the question but it is for the benefit of cain and and he said you know look uh he's giving him a chance to repent and he's saying you know uh if you if you bring a good sacrifice of course you're you're going to be accepted Right, um, you know, you brought it rightly, but you didn't divide the sacrifice rightly, right? So you kind of again, the good intention wasn't there, um, 
and you know look you you're the firstborn you you have the inheritance right you're you're the first one you had the inheritance you should rule over Abel you know you, there's no reason to be jealous there's no reason to be angry but what does Cain do Cain murders his own brother and when God says to Cain where is thy brother again when we see God asking questions that is him calling on for repentance even murder was something Cain could have repented of as horrible as it is Cain could have repented. But what does Cain do? He says, am I my brother's keeper? So this is a rejection of Cain's role in creation that God has given to him. So it is a rejection of God. Um, it is a rejection of the purpose that he was created for in a way. And we see then in scripture... And God says that the voice of your brother's blood cries from the ground. Now, this means that justice needs to be dispensed, right? There needs to be justice to be dispensed. But we need to understand the nature of God's justice is rehabilitative. It is not condemnatory only. It is for the purpose of rehabilitation. And <clears throat> although justice must be given, there is... No tension, no dialectic between justice and mercy, as a matter of fact. A lot of kind of like Western modes of thinking puts a false dialectic between justice and mercy. But God's justice in many, many instances is his mercy. And we're going to see an example here. But before we, before we understand the example, you need to understand the, the mode in which justice properly operates. It operates on the principle of the golden rule and uh, an eye for an eye. And in, in many ways, the eye for an eye and the golden rule are no different. What is the golden rule? Well, do unto others what you will like done, done unto you. Treat others the way you want to be treated. And what is an eye for an eye? The way you treat others is how you're going to be treated. It's basically the same thing, right? An eye for an eye is just kind of like the basic application of the golden rule. So... That is how normal justice, you know, will be dispensed, right? Kind of like the, um, the default manner, so to speak. But what is the punishment that God gives to Cain? He says, well, when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. So basically, you're going to have a tougher time and you're not going to have, you know, you're going to have to find another place to stay. Basically, you're going to have to move away. And compared to what Cain, I mean, Cain deserved, right? If he wants to dispense, I don't want to say full justice, but the default mode of justice, if that was to be dispensed to Cain, it will result in Cain be, being dead. Like Cain will be dead if the default mode was dispensed. But we see the rehabilitative mode was dispensed. Because God thinks that was better, right? There's a better thing to do. And, and you know, the part of the reason why this is a dialectic is because some people say, oh, well, the, the full justice wasn't dispensed. The full justice. What makes you think a specific principle is the full and the other principle isn't the full? The, the more correct thinking is that justice and mercy has many modes. And so the full justice could be dispensed in a different manner according to that different circumstance that is not not dispensing full justice justice is not justice is a characteristic of god and so to kind of speak of i would say to to kind of imply that there can be like half justice dispensed i mean that will create some form of composition in god i would say um but there is no composition if there wherever there is justice from god that's full justice. Where there's mercy from God, there's full mercy. It's the fullness of it, right? Not a part of it because you don't really have parts of it. You don't have parts of justice in God. Again, that creates composition in God. They're not parts. Uh, there aren't any parts. There aren't any parts in God. So, uh, having said that, let's move on with Cain's reaction, right? Cain, you know, the justice that is dispensed to Cain 
is very minor. And what does Cain say? My punishment is greater than I can bear. So he's still complaining. Cain is still complaining like a baby. In a way, he is like a baby because, again, although, you know, there's some maturity, the human development at that time was not in the way that it is today. It's, it's very dissimilar. So in many ways, Cain and Abel were still very childlike, um, mentally speaking. And Cain then says, well, because I'm going to be a fugitive and a vagabond, uh, you know, someone can come up to me and kill me in vengeance, right? So what's keeping me safe? You know, I need protection. That's kind of basically uh, uh, what is being said. And then Cain says, whoever slays you, I'm going to give you a mark. And whoever slays you, vengeance will be taken from him sevenfold. And of course, Cain, it's natural for Cain to be afraid of death because especially death in today's age, in the New Testament era and the Old Testament era, they're different, right? Um, and when you die in the Old Testament era, you go to Hades. When you, when you die in, your, in the New Testament era, if you are a, you know, if you're a proper Christian, if you were baptized, and if you um, live an actual Christ-like life, and if you follow Christ, then you will go to heaven. So there's no reason to fear death anymore in the New Testament era. But in the Old Testament, fear of death was very, very natural. Um, it would be quite unnatural to not be fearful of it, in fact. So, Cain is protected by God, and he goes to the land of Nod. Nod means um, away from God, something akin to that. And that's why it was given that name. And uh, Cain went out from God's presence. And he knew his wife. Now, his wife was his sister, but again, due to the conditions of that time, um, it was allowed, right? So, so uh, in family marriages basically were allowed due to the condition of that time. That doesn't mean that they're morally acceptable, right? So there was economia, dispensation, right? That was given to them. But this doesn't mean, and by the way, when I say dispensation, I don't mean dispensationalism or anything like that. I just mean that uh, the law was relaxed to accommodate to the situation that was at hand. So, some people might say, oh, well, you know, polygamy, etc. Does that? No. It's dispensed for the situation at hand. That's why it was allowed. It doesn't mean that it is approved. God, you know, the, Christ permits divorce. But that doesn't mean he allows for it, right? So, there's a distinction here. Um, the Orthodox Church, again, is against contraception, divorce, etc. But if it economically allows them to accommodate to man's weakness, that is not an approval of it. And a lot of people confuse this because a lot of these people have a very legalistic um, Talmudic understanding of these things. Um, so we, we should avoid that. And then we see uh, Cain's you know, descendants. One of them is Lamech, and Lamech is going to be very important here. Enoch is also there. Of course, Enoch is also important, but I'm going to be focusing him more on Genesis 5. So Lamech, in verse 23, says to his wives that he, like Cain, has killed a young man. Now, the difference between Lamech and Cain here is Lamech actually confesses his sin. What do we see here? Confession. Lamech confesses his sins. Now, again, people will say, well, confession is not in the Bible. Or well, what's the point of confessing to a priest? I can just go into my room and confess to God. So what are you going to do? Oh, God, I confess to you that I did X, Y, Z. That's not confession. How is that confession? God already knows what you did, right? And you might say, well, I feel bad about it. Oh, I, I, I just feel bad about it now. But what do we see in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament? Because James also says, confess your sins. And he doesn't say, confess your sins to, like, he says, confess your sins to each other. Because confessing your sins to each other is confessing your sins to God. That is the mode in which confession is actualized. That's how confession is actualized. How is it actualized in Genesis 4.23? Lamech doesn't say, God, appear to me so I can confess. No. You know what he says? He says, 
to his wives, I have killed a man. So Lamech confesses his sins to God by confessing it to his wives. And then he says, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Now this is a kind of like a numerical principle you see in, in the New Testament as well. You know, if, if someone sins against us seven times, you know, you know how many times should we forgive him? Seven, time, uh, seven times seventy, you know. Uh, so basically, as much as you can, you know, like as much as you can. No, no, no. Always. If there's a confession, you should always forgive. If there's repentance, you should always forgive. And what Lamech is pointing out here, I think, is he understands that sin is going to continue through the descendants over and over again. And that there is a need for a Messiah to truly destroy and kill sin. And who does that? Christ does that, right? Who's the Messiah? He takes on sin in his own body. Not that he sinned, but rather he took death on his body crucified it on the cross, and destroyed it. This is why we are not, as Christians, afraid of death. Death does not bring us fear anymore. And that's why Christ defeated death by death, as we say um, in Pascha. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare his son and called his name Seth. And now this is going to be very interesting because we kind of talked about this in the previous stream as well, but Adam, Eve, and Seth... And I have a, even a video on this. But Adam, Eve, and Seth, in a way, humanly represents the Trinity. How? Adam is unbegotten, Eve proceeds from Adam, and Seth is begotten from Adam. And you can see uh, this in the Trinity too. The Father is unbegotten, the Son is begotten, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. So there's an analogy for the Trinity here. Now there's a there's a this you know all analogies are analogies. There's similarities. That's the point of analogies. But the fact that their analogy their analogy proves there's also dissimilarities. So what are the dissimilarities? Well, the Holy Spirit is not God's wife, right? And the Son does not come from the Holy Spirit. The Holy the Holy Spirit and the Son do not have a familial relationship. They have a familial relationship insofar as, you know, they have an association due to the co uh, the community of essence. You can call it that, right? The, the fam familial relationship insofar in that manner, but in the manner of being a son or a brother, no, there is no that form of relationship. That relationship exists between the father and the son. Uh, so there's, there's that point as well. So there's those kinds of dissimilarities, but I don't think it is a coincidence that Adam is unbegotten and Seth is begotten. That's a given, but I don't think it's a coincidence that Eve proceeds from Adam's rib. I don't think that's a coincidence. There's a different mode of existing from Eve that, that the son and the father don't have, right? So three distinct hypostatic properties in which you can distinguish between Adam, Eve, and Seth. Three distinct hypostatic properties between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that you can distinguish. So now let's go to Genesis 5. Um, where, uh, gen in Genesis 5, we kind of see a recapitulation. Um, we see that God made man in his image, which is according to the nature of man. But likeness is... Is something you know we are also made in God's likeness but we lost it in the fall and so uh, the image of God is according to nature but the likeness is according to hypostasis and so it is how we actualize or will in following God that is what determines whether we or likeness to God is restored all right uh, and so Seth is begun from Adam and then we see the descendants of Seth uh, I believe. So one of the things I will say is that Enoch, especially, you know, we know the book of Enoch and um, again, we're not looking into the book of Enoch, but I guess I, I could also mention that since we're talking about uh, the antediluvian period, we, one of the things that the book of Enoch talks about 
in regards to the antediluvian period <clears throat> is <clears throat> that there were a lot of different crazy technologies and even magic, right? The kind of like technology and magic were kind of seen as syn synonyms at the time uh, that existed at the time that we just don't have today, again, that, because they were wiped from the flood. Um, and Enoch in particular, you know, was a holy man and holiness could be attained even in that period. So it was possible to be holy and he was translated to paradise instead of suffering death. Now, there are some fathers that in fact state that Enoch is going to come at the time of the Antichrist. He's going to die at the hand of the Antichrist. And by by Enoch's blood, the Antichrist will be defeated. So um, there, are some, there are some church fathers that say that. You can go to Katana Bible and look at the Bible verses in question. And you can see the patristic commentary. But even sometimes with citations. Although you can find a citation easily if you just put, you know, search it on Google. Uh but we see in Genesis 5.29, the birth of Noah. Now, if you have listened to my talk on St. Theophilus of Antioch, uh, he talks about the different kind of flood myths. Now, first of all, many cultures have a flood myth. Of course, there is dissimilar details. So, for example, the Greeks thought the flood was only local. Um, but they believed that there was a person called Deucalion coming out of the, of the flood who served you know she so survived it and that the Colion says saint theophilus is based on noah and the is a combination of come and call that is you know noah call comes to us and calls us to repentance in the ark of salvation and we will see in the next chapter that noah is a, is a type of christ um and the ark has has very important significance uh, in relation to the church and so we start with genesis 6 oh before before no, no before we go to genesis 6 there's also the sons of noah shem ham and japheth they are kind of the the archetypical nations the source of nations so shem are the shem are the semites ham are the, are the are the africans and japhetites are the europeans and far eastern asians All, although you know Generally speaking, we could also understand that you know some different nations come as a combination of of these three. So sometimes it's a combination of these three. Sometimes there's a combination of Shemites and Hamites that you know a nation comes from. Yeah, it can be a combination from Japhetites and Hamites or Japhetites and Shemites. Um, so there there are different combinations. Uh, some nations are a result of these different combinations. Is a more accurate way of explaining it. Uh, but they are the three, you know, archetypical races of the earth that will repopulate the earth after the flood, which we're going to be not be going to be talking about in this video, unfortunately. But uh, in Genesis 6, 1 and 2, we see the introduction of the sons of God. Now, there are two theories. The, the number one, the, the first theory is that the sons of God are the descendants of Seth and Enoch. The second interpretation, which a lot of people seem to love a lot because they constantly talk about this over and over again. And they seem to be in love with this interpretation because it seems like it's based on the book of Enoch. I, maybe, I think from, I don't know much, but uh, I'm going off of memory of what people said. They say that the sons of God are the Nephilim. And so they say that the, that the, that the Nephilim and woman you know, had sex and they brought forth half demon, half people, you know, creatures or like giant, or, you know, the giants are, you know, the, the race of the giants come from that, from fallen angels and, uh, and the doors of men and, and things like that. The, I'm not going to say like which one I think. Now, I think both are possible. How? Uh, well, you know, sons of God can refer to genuinely to the descendants of Seth and uh, and Enoch, but is it possible that there were demonic rituals where they summoned demons and Nephilim and all of these creatures, and some of these rituals included sexual acts? Yes, I believe that. 
do I believe that angels, like men, can have sex with women and cause a woman to give birth to a demon human baby? I think that's stupid. I think that's stupid. I don't think anyone should believe in that. I haven't even seen fathers believe in that. I don't think they will say something like that. But again, can there be rituals that in a way imitate right, uh, sexual relations? Yes, it can be an inversion of marriage, for example. It can be an inversion of becoming one flesh. And instead, they become one flesh with the demonic spirit. So in that sense, you know, you can talk about marriage in that sense. But I want to be very clear that I, I, think, it's a, I think it's very silly to believe that uh, angels can just have sex with one. I just think that's ludicrous. It's absolutely ludicrous. And uh, some people do believe in that, but I think that's absolutely ludicrous. I think they were coming out as a result of demonic rituals. And that's what was going on at those times. And this is why God saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth. And God, and it's, you know, we see kind of like human attributions given to God, that God repented. And this doesn't mean that God repented. How can God repent when he's all-knowing, Right? But God is rather sad at what is going on. He's grieving at what is going on. But we see that Noah was a holy man that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so Noah was pretty much the only righteous man, pretty much the only righteous man that was living on earth. And the rest of the earth was corrupt. And so now we are getting into... Uh, understanding the Ark of the Covenant, which is very, 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 very important. <clears throat> the Ark is very important because in many ways, it, 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 it typifies a lot of different things that we can see in the New Testament. And the, the, the typologies within the Ark also exemplify various different Christian doctrines and the church itself, because the Ark is a type of the church, and even the sacraments. Yes, even the sacraments are typified in the ark. So the first thing we want to see is that God said uh, that God says to Noah in verse 14, <clears throat> Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch within it within and without with pitch. So the ark is made out of wood. Keep this in mind, it's going to be important as we get into the cubits, right? Because what do many atheists do? Many atheists, you know, they kind of, uh, I, I've seen this a couple of years ago. They kind of make this statement, oh, the, the measurements are not mathematically possible. God thinks, uh, uh, you know, God thinks pi equals three and, and all this kind of stuff. Oh, this, the circumference and all this kind of stuff. They're not mathematically passed. They're mathematically inaccurate, right? And what they don't get is that these numbers are estimations, but at the same time, these numbers also point out, point towards a greater and deeper truth. That's the point of the numbers used for the Ark, for example. Now, I don't know if they're making this argument specifically for the Ark, but uh, I've, I've seen this argument being used in the, for against the Old Testament, even the New Testament, I think. Uh, but we see that the Ark, the length of the Ark, shall be 300 cubits. The breadth of it 50 cubits and the height of it 30 cubits. So what do these numbers mean? Well, we can look at St. Jerome and his commentary on this. St. Jerome says, first of all, he starts with the number of 300. And this, first of all, oh, by the way, there's like two different views. There's St. Jerome's view and then St. Augustine's view, which is obviously complementary with each other, as we're going to see. But the length of the arc shall be 300 cubits. Now, in Greek numerals, what is 300 in Greek numerals? That looks like something, that resembles something very familiar now, doesn't it? It does. It resembles the cross, right? So, we see then that these numbers signify essential aspects of what the Ark typifies, which is the church. Because in the church do we find salvation. And outside the church, what is death, right? So in the church, there is salvation. And what, is, what are the characteristics of the church? Number one, the crucifixion. Pope St. Leo, in his tome, 
says that the church subsists from what was flowing from Christ's side, that is the water and blood, right? <clears throat> so the church subsists by the crucifixion. The breadth of it is 50 cubits. 50. Psalm 50. What, what is the 50th Psalm? The Psalm of Repentance. So by the way, again, as you can see, there, we're, we're operating with the Septuagint here. Um, so repentance is an essential aspect of what constitutes the church. And the height, and this is all like this, this, this is not an exhaustive like list either. You know, these are some of the essential characteristics. There's other essential characteristics too, that it has a community, ecclesia, right? And we can see that Noah and his family constitutes the ecclesia of the church, in typologically speaking. The height of it, 30 cubits. 30, that is the age that Christ started his ministry. So Christ's ministry and its continuation, right? So the beginning and its continuation is also an essential aspect of the church. <clears throat> so then we can see here um, that these numbers typologically represent and prophesy Christ. But there's also another thing because the church is the body of Christ, right? The church is the body of Christ. Well, St. Augustine has something very interesting to say about that. St. Augustine says, I, I'm quoting him directly, Even the very measurements of length, height, and breadth of the ark are meant to point to the reality of the human body into which he came as it was foretold that he will come. It will be recalled that the length of a normal body from head to foot is six times the breadth from one side to the other and ten times the thickness from back to front. Measure a man who is lying on the ground, either prone or supine. He is six times as long from head to foot as he is wide from left to right or right to left. And he is ten times as long as he is high from the ground up. That is why the ark was made 300 cubits in length, 50 in breadth, and 30 in height. So the ark is a human body. What does the ark typify? The church. What is the church? The body of Christ. So... There's another aspect. Oh, did you think that's it? Well, wait, there is even more. Because the Ark also typifies. Again, how can how can this the Ark typifies the Theotokos too? How it typifies the church? Now it typifies the Virgin Mary? Yes, because there are no dialects. There is no either or. We're not speaking. I mean, there are either ors, but in this case, there is no either or. Why will there be either ors here? Because we are looking at symbols here. We're looking at a a prophecy an implicit prophecy pointing to the future so the ark is also a type of the virgin mary why well noah is a type of christ because he brings on a new creation a new world <clears throat> so in that manner he typifies christ and the virgin mary and then how does noah you know where does noah reside in, in this creation new creation in the ark so for the case of christ in the womb of the virgin mary and we see then also that christ in his birth sanctifies the womb of the virgin mary this is why because the virgin mary is sanctified by bearing god in his womb and in her womb her she is her whole body is sanctified and this is why it is important to believe in uh perpetual virginity because virginity is a higher spiritual state than the married life. Now, does that mean that uh, the you know those who are married cannot become spiritually higher than those who are virgins? They can. They can easily be right. But we're talking about we're just looking at virginity itself. We're not we're not like saying they're a higher caste, right? Again, get the dialectics out of your head. Get it out. Get it out. No dialectics. No either ors. All right, none of that false dichotomies and oppositions with each other. Get that out of your head. All right, we're looking at virginity itself and marriage itself. This is not really that difficult. Virginity, in contrast to marriage, is a higher state. Does that you know? But someone that is married can be of a general higher spiritual state than a virgin. But Christ, who who exemplifies the highest form of spiritual life, guess what? He was also a virgin. 
all right he was also a virgin and the and so we can clearly see in the scripture that virginity is a higher form of spiritual life than marriage. But that doesn't mean that virgi virgins are a higher spiritual caste, right? It's a completely different thing that is never in scripture. And no one makes that argument, by the way. The critiques of this kind of an understanding are just, they're just inserting this in their own because, again, their head is full of false stupid dialectics that we shall false dialectics and false oppositions that we are to completely avoid. And another thing, right, we see that various animals enter the ark, right? Uh, Noah's family enters the ark, the various different animals enter the ark. But what do we notice going on in the ark? Again, that typifies the church. Uh, well, there are no sexual relations in the ark. How do we know that? Well, the animals that get in, numerically, the same animals get out. And they don't just jump out of the ark. They stay in the ark. The animals that get in, same amount of animals and people get out. So therefore, there was no sexual relations going on in the ark. Because it typifies the church, right? Again, it, it points towards the higher spiritual standard of life which is virginity, which is being chaste. And again, I know some people are going to say, oh, you think sex is evil? Blah, blah. Hey, first of all, sex is corruption. This is not a controversial belief. This is in St. Athanasius even. Why do you think there was virgin birth? Why do you think the virgin birth was necessary? There's a reason why it was necessary. Because sex is a result of the fallen mode of living does that mean it's evil no it's a it's a feature of the fallen world so let's not be silly here um and and first of all some people might say well maybe there wasn't any space in the ark. no the ark could potentially include everyone right in fact i believe uh, there was kind of like a period in time you know at any time there could be anyone coming to know and say, hey, you know, bring me into the ark. I want to join. I want to join in. Right. So they had a chance to repent, but they didn't. And now we see creation being renewed by the flood. Now water, right? Water renews and purifies. That is regenerates. The earth, as a result of the flood, was regenerated. What is this pointing towards to? Baptism. Right, but at the same time, the seas also typified something else, and it typified the dangers of heresies that is being outside the church. Again, the only way to be protected was by being in the ark. The ark was what protected you, and that is, if you want to be saved, you have to be in the church. The church is the ark of salvation, of which there is no salvation outside. Now, again, this. Might get into a different topic of, uh, well, you know, in what way do we understand outside of church there is no salvation? Um, I am not going to get into this debate in this video because it has nothing to do with it. But it is indeed true that outside of church there is no salvation. Now, how you read it, that's a different topic. Okay, that's a completely different topic. Um, some people can read it in a very rigorous way. Some people can read it in a in a more accommodating way. I happen to read the more accommodating um, view personally, but uh, we then see the the period of the flood. Right, the rain was upon the earth forty days and uh, forty nights. So we see that the firmament was opened. The firmament was opened. And the waters above the firmament flooded in. This was the opening of the firmament, I think, signifies a drastic, radical change in the way the world existed. And this is the problem with trying to find, you know, trying to determine the age of something and all this kind of stuff of archaeology, etc. Because the some of the laws of the world is different compared to the antediluvian period to the post-diluvian period. An example will be the rate of decay, right? The flood could have caused things, and I think it did cause things, that will, if we use assumptions of the post-diluvian world and apply it to the antediluvian world, 
end with the addition of the flood. If, if we completely negate them and we ignore them and we just move on with the assumption that the world was always in every regard post-Diluvian, then it's only natural that we are going to have stupid findings where some things are going to be 2 million years old. And of course, you know, the carbon dating is itself faulty, right? But even the kind of like the more traditional ways of finding how old something is, or even like the distance of the planets or all of these different things, they are not going to be, okay, they're not going to be accurate at all. After the antediluvian world, the accuracy, whatever material way you're going to, unless you account for the metaphysics of the antediluvian world, you're never going to find anything correct. Never. You're not going to find something correct. You're not going to find a dating correct. Your findings are going to be spurious, right? Because of this presupposition. Now you might say, you know, as an atheist, well, why do I have to believe in the flood? Well, first of all, the flood was believed by all cultures, right? So it is not a fringe belief. belief. Uh, and there's, in fact, more evidence, more documentary evidence that there was, in fact, a flood, even archaeological evidence, but more documentary evidence that the flood happened than the flood not happening. And the response to that, oh, well, they're just telling a story that's just like made up and all this kind of stuff. It's like, you know, it, you can use, it's just flimsy, right? It's just, it's just, so people are, so people, okay, look, the people, they already have low resources, right? They're just going to write stuff that's like made up. Come on. Okay, come on. Right? I'm not saying that makes everything they write true. What I am saying, here's what I'm saying. It, it means that they thought it was valuable enough to write down. That's what it proves. That's what I'm getting at. So you might say, well, why do I have to assume that there is such a thing as the antediluvian world? Well, why do I have to assume that the world was always like it is? In fact, I can provide proof for my assumption with evidence. You can't. What is your evidence? None. What is your evidence? Oh, well, I've lived in this life and nothing like this happened. That's that's your only evidence, right? Uh, we, we can look at the... Wait. The, oh, wait. We can't look at the documents because the documents prove my point. <laughs> the documents disprove you. So what are you going to look at? Oh, we can look at archaeological... No, the archaeological findings and whether they are accurate. They are the very things in question. They are the things in question. So all of this, like, uh, disproving uh, young earth by science is completely invalid. Look at, the, look at what we believe in our scripture. We believe that the earth was metaphysically, in many ways, different today compared to back then. This is part of our belief. The firmaments were open. The waters flooded all across the world. The waters renewed creation in a typological manner. And you're going to come here and tell me that, no, actually nothing changed. And we can know that nothing changed. Again, how? Uh, well, it's just, it's just crazy to believe in the existence of God. And then it just goes to well, whether God exists or not. Which, here's the point that I'm trying to make here. If God exists, we can easily reconcile the seemingly impossible findings we can easily reconcile with the existence of God. But if you don't believe in the existence of God, you can you know, then you have a bigger problem. How do you know there is regularity in nature, the very thing you're presupposing and you're trying to prove without God? It's just, dare I say it, faith, just an assumption, it's just an assumption that you work with and it just works. Compared to what I have been saying here for this video for such a long time, seems like what I'm saying makes a lot more sense than whatever nonsense you're spouting to me. So, I think once you kind of understand that, it's quite easy to understand uh, The legitimacy, right? The further legitimacy of believing in it. Suddenly, there is really no obstacle in believing in old earth. I mean, young earth, sorry. Not old earth. In fact, there seems to be more legitimacy to believe in the young earth than the old earth, really. Another reason why uh, I want to point out is I believe... Um, yeah, this is this is further stated in these verses. and you can. But uh, St. Ephraim the Syrian, in his commentary on Genesis, because he's working with the Peshitta, he actually calculates... 
that the entirety of the flood until you know Noah stepped on the earth lasted 365 days and he says this is where we get a year from 365 days of the flood gives us a year and that kind of made me think what if the and and this is something this is this is much more kind of like my own speculation again i really don't like i'm only making a speculation in response to you know some of the kind of criticisms these people make about older younger whatever is what if because in, in the biblical sense a day is defined by morning and evening what if you know today a day is 24 hours because you know, you can also part. You can also point out due to the celestial movements, but in you know in Genesis one, it says that the days were determined by God's light. What if one of the differences between the world back then and world today is that we, instead of being influenced by God's light in what makes a day and evening, is in fact that that role has changed from celestial bodies now celestial bodies have more of an influence under the providence of god of course everything that is being done is under the providence of god he has complete control over but what if god delegated that to the celestial bodies what if now right ever since the flood now the day the the night cycle day cycle etc is under the purview of the movements of you know sun and moon etc it's highly possible right and maybe that's what the 365 days of flood is pointing to, right? A year passed by and we are now in a new mode of living. We are in a mode of a new kind of a life. So, you know, you can maybe perhaps argue that by the standards of, uh, like, post, I mean, even the, even the concept of a day can be in re-evaluation, although... If someone wants to say, you know, the six days of creation were, were, were uh, six 24-hour days, to be honest, like, to me, I won't even reject that. Like, I don't I don't think that's, you know, it's highly possible that maybe, you know, a day was always 24 hours. It's highly possible. Um, it's just, you know, something interesting to think about. Um, and it's not something, you know, if, if it's, if there's, if there's a, you know, fatal, in, um inconsistency i'm willing to completely say okay i'm going to drop this theory of mine it's worthless you know it's just some something to think about uh in my opinion but yes we can see that you know the, the flood was global to the point i mean some people say well the bible doesn't say the flood was global well, i mean even the flying birds were killed by the flood so the flood is so violent that even flying birds are going to be dying but somehow it's local. Does it, that doesn't make any sense. Right? Does it absolutely makes no sense. How can it be that high and then only affect? Well, it doesn't make any sense. Um, it doesn't make any geographical sense. It doesn't make any, any form of sense, really. Uh, <clears throat> it only makes sense if the flood was global, which it was. This is why every culture has a flood myth. Nearly every culture has a flood myth. And so we see in Genesis 8, after the, after the flood, right? Well, when, you know, everything seems to have kind of calm down uh, Noah opens the door and sends a raven but the raven doesn't come back and then he sends a dove and the dove returns to the ark uh, and with a olive leaf right which is today we know this as a symbol of peace um, but the dove comes back with an olive leaf and then the dove is sent again and the dove does not come anymore. What is happening here? Now, um, now, <clears throat> ravens are animals that like to feast on dead carcasses. And there were no doubt many dead carcasses on the earth. And this is why it didn't come back. And there is a typological meaning behind it too. There's a symbol sim symbolical meaning behind it. It's the, the raven is an earthly creature. And it left the church and it didn't come back. Right? As in... And it not really leaving the church, but it left the church for earthly things, right? It left the church for earthly things and it didn't come back. And so it in a way symbolizes the unbaptized, you can say. It symbolizes those who uh, leave the church. Uh, but maybe they symbolize those who, are, who were baptized, but they just didn't put off the old man, which is why they're still dark. A dove, in contrast, um, 
comes back and then you know brings in all the leaf all of leaf uh in his in his mouth now i believe the olive leaf also signifies chrismation oh well another another sacrament beautiful just just a bunch of sacraments um you know it's a component of the chrism in baptism and so both baptism and chrismation are prefigured in the dove which also by the way represents the holy spirit the dove also represents the holy spirit right because the dove uh, the, the dove the holy spirit came down to christ in his baptism in the shape of a dove in the form of a dove and so we have sacrament we have a uh, prophecies about the church christ and the sacraments baptism confession and uh chrismation so <clears throat> we can see then that after creation disembarks from the ark there is not an increase or a decrease in number it's the same number because there is no sexual relations in the ark the ark represents the church and it is a place of holiness and chastity and so multiplication happens now that they are on the earth and now they are to continue and further their species they are to multiply afterwards right and so we see that with the renewal of creation that is about to be multiplied again we get to the team again with the same relationship between genesis 1 and genesis 2. genesis 2 everything happens in reverse because it is about the resurrection and now the earth is being multiplied again the earth is becoming resurrected right which again points to christ's resurrection and what does noah do the first thing noah does is that he builds an altar to god and offered sacrifice to god so we see you know noah is giving thanks to god but as we also see uh we also see some form of organized religion here some organized form of worship by noah so again, organized worship is a production of Christianity or whatever. No, organized religion, organized worship with its structures, it's in the Old Testament. It's in, it's in Noah, right? He builds an altar to God. And God says that he smelled a sweet savor. That is, he liked the intention, the heart of Noah's sacrifice and as a result, he says, well, the crea creation was renewed. It does not need another renewal. That is, it does not need a rebaptism. And don't worry, I'm not making a snarky comment against so-called rebaptism. I'm just saying there's only one baptism. That's all I'm saying. Um, that again, the rebaptism or reception by rebaptism is a completely different debate that I'm not going to be talking about in this video. But um, there is no rebaptism. There is no point in re renewing. Europe. There is no point in re rebaptism or like rebaptism or anything like that. Um, and so God says and, and promises that He is not going to smite uh, living things. He's not going to destroy the earth anymore, right? Because of Noah. And we also see that Noah, who cooperates with God, who synergizes his will to God's will, we see this kind of uh influence that noah has in god's decision making does that mean that god depends on creation creatures to make decisions no rather that god responds to creation because he is a personal god he's not an impersonal deity that doesn't care about what's going on he's a personal deity that does care about what is going on in his creation so he is in that manner a personal god and again god doesn't care about noah's sacrifice he cares about the contrite spirit and the broken heart that is behind Noah's sacrifice, as Psalm 50 says. <clears throat> and we see, again, the re-implementation of the seasons, right? So while the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Again, I think that's not a coincidence. I think it might really be pointing towards a difference between, you know, antediluvian and postdiluvian days seasons etc and with having said that that will conclude this video that will be concluding this video um 
And thank you for watching. If you if this video helped you, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And and I'm gonna conclude this also by thanking uh, the patrons who have been financially supporting my channel. Uh, thank you to Kerry, Ignatius, Mike, Jack, Teresa, Nectarius, Flooded Basement, Dave, Colton, David, and Norbert. Thank you all for supporting this channel. If you want to support this channel as well, you can go check out my Patreon Patreon page page, or you can donate to me via Bitcoin. All in the link in the description below. And hopefully you like this video. Like, share, subscribe if you haven't already. Comment some nice stuff. Um, and I will see you all in the next video. Thank you for watching and may God be with you all. Goodbye.